Good morning, everyone. 大家早，欢迎大家来到我们台湾素食营养学会举办的医疗新思维：当啊、呃、饮食与生活形态遇上基因。及慢性病。那我们今天非常荣幸有三位，呃，从美国远道而来的讲师。那首先我要先欢迎我们台湾素食营养学会的副理事长，也是台大生化科技系黄清珍老师，来为我们讲几句欢迎的话。请大家呃欢迎黄老师。So early on this rainy Sunday morning, and you are smart and lucky to come to a very good symposium this morning. Okay, I think you, all of you, must be just like me, that have been attracted by the title of our symposium today: genes and、um, lifestyle medicine. Yes. Uh, lifestyle medicine is new to most of us in Taiwan, and all our three outstanding speakers today are from Department of Medicine, Loma Linda University, and they are experts promoting lifestyle medicine for many years. Some of you may have known that Loma Linda. Is a Seventh-day Adventist university. About 30 years ago, I read some papers describing epidemiological studies comparing Seventh-day Adventists with general Americans. Those studies all demonstrated much lower prevalence of chronic disease in this specific population. Than general Americans, so that is my first impression that balanced vegetarian diet is healthier. In 2007, the World Cancer Research Fund recommended a 10 dietary guideline of、uh, for preventing cancer. One of the guidelines is a plant-based diet to prevent cancers. So I support the vegetarian uh, diet uh, here in Taiwan, and I join this society.、Uh, so I think we will have a very、uh, fruitful、uh, learning this morning, and I、uh, welcome our three speakers from Loma Linda University, and thank you very much for giving us this new uh, uh, subject. In this field, and very important, and I um uh, uh I said the last one in Chinese. Okay. 祝福大家今天早上有一个非常丰富的学习。谢谢大家。Thank you very much. 谢谢黄老师的致辞。那呃，刚,刚没有想说黄老师会用英文讲，所以忘了请大家呃，如果你需要翻译机的话，可以戴上耳机，然后把耳机跟桌上的电源连线。那中文翻译的部分就是用频道一，那这样子就会有这个呃中文。我们有请同步专业的同步口译帮大家翻译。好，那我们接下来就要进入我们第一位讲师啊、呃、，Dr. John Kelly。Um, Dr. John Kelly 呢，他是在呃、uh, Loma Linda University 拿到他的呃、uh, 医生的呃、uh, 这个 MD 的 degree， 还有 MPH。那他是呢，少数我知道呢，呃、uh, ，就是我们在 lifestyle medicine 用这种饮食生活形态去改变疾病的呃、uh, 少数的一个呃、um, 先锋在做这个领域的。那呃，我觉得今天非常的难得可以邀请到他。大家可能之前如果有看过我们的动画，说在马歇尔岛他们有很高的糖尿病，那之后呢是用这个饮食去改变。Dr. Kelly 就是呃这一个呃研究计划的医生，所以他有非常多的经验。我们今天真的非常高兴可以邀请到呃 Dr. John Kelly， 呃，大家一起鼓掌欢迎他，谢谢。
morning, and thank you for having me here. It's my privilege to be with you. I'm going to talk this morning about the way that our lifestyle choices change our gene expression. And not only our gene expression, as you're going to see, changes us. And the exciting thing is that we are learning how the lifestyle changes accomplish the amazing things that they do. Let me just see if I can operate the equipment. Okay, uh, this talk I often use in a medical conference, so I have the learning objectives here, uh, but they may not be so rigorous this morning. But we're gonna talk about genetics and epigenetics and the difference we're gonna be able to uh, recall three milestones in genomics or genetics research and be able to explain this statement, your genes are not your destiny. But first, let me begin, as we often do in medical talks, with case history, okay? A couple or three ex actual cases. Here is a uh, picture of the Marshall Islands where we, I did some research. We spent a couple million dollars, US dollars, in uh, doing research on the diabetes epidemic that's going on in Marshall Islands. In fact, may, many of you may know that Micronesia is probably one of the uh, places on the planet that is most affected by diabetes, type 2 diabetes. We had Dr. Wes Youngberg working with us. We had a little fitness center where we tested fitness. And then the, uh, the uh, top right, this is our compounding pharmacy. Uh, this is uh, the kitchen because with lifestyle medicine, food is medicine. And so um, it's very true that a proper cook is uh, worth her weight in gold, or his weight in gold. This was uh, a, the result, one of the um, charts of our looking at the hemoglobin, the glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. Um, and this was showing the pattern. They started off over 10. Those of you who know anything about this know that you should never have an A1C greater than seven, probably, and a normal, healthy person would be more like six, five and a half or six. So the, this shows you how bad the condition, and how, how uh, severe the diabetes is in the Marshall Islands. But you also see there a tremendous drop uh, in the intensive intervention phase, and this was a 25-week intervention with considerable difference uh, by the end. You also see something else that we see in almost all of these kinds of interventions, and that is the, uh, the rise. Let's see if I have a pointer. Yeah, okay, well, I guess I don't know how to use it yet. But anyway, the, you can see this rise. I need to practice. Um, anyhow, where the, the, the curve goes back up somewhat after the uh, intensive part of the intervention. This was the um, first 10 days of that first intervention group. And you can see the uh, fasting glucose. This was finger stick readings every day. But the regression line tells you that we had a 74 point drop in the um, fasting blood sugar. That's in milligrams per deciliter, uh, not the metric system. But this was remarkable in uh, just 10 days. I've shown this chart in some medical conferences and the physicians would ask later say, what did you, did you give an insulin pump? How did you, how did you do this? And we said, well, actually, the two people that were on insulin had to stop, stop their insulin. There's no insulin in that, that drop. That is strictly from lifestyle changes. Uh, we can give credit to, uh, part of the credit for sure, to Brenda Davis, uh, a, a remarkable dietitian and nutritionist that some of you, I'm sure, know the name, Brenda Davis, I've written a couple of books on this. She worked with us there. So, okay, my next uh, case is, involves uh, an outpatient center that I ran for a few years in Virginia. It's still in operation, but uh, uh, we were, were there for, uh, started it off and ran it for a number of years. And we used the CHIP uh, curriculum, which you're gonna hear more about, uh, is the father of CHIP talks here next, uh, or at the end, I guess. Here's a little illustration of uh, a, a simulation of an echocardiogram. This is a way that you can use ultrasound to visualize the heart. And I wanted you to see this because the next case, this uh, individual, uh, 
Charles Kelly. That happens to be my brother, so I have permission to use his uh, results. But um, here's what they, his first uh, evaluation showed was that after reviewing everything, we have recommended it, that he undergo an coronary angiography with intervention if indicated. In other words, he had an evaluation done um, um, just as he was getting ready to retire. So he's 65 year old male. And they found uh, indication of ischemic heart disease. So they wanted to do an angiogram and put a stent, okay, the little, well, uh, Charles didn't want to do that. He, uh, he reads too much. And so he had uh, read and discovered that one out of 500 of these can be very dangerous. In fact, uh, some people die from a simple stent that goes wrong. So he decided he wanted to make lifestyle changes instead. And he contacted me and asked me about it. And I said, now there's nine of us children in my family and he's the oldest brother. So if I killed him, I would have eight people trying to, to take care of me. <laughs> so I didn't want to get the whole family. I'm half joking, only half. <laughs> but I said, you can only make lifestyle changes if you really make lifestyle changes. I'm not going to be a scapegoat for you to to, you know, fail to get the care you need. So he was very serious and he made changes. You know what he did? He became a vegetarian. And, uh, but even after a year of making a lifestyle change and uh, going vegetarian, his cholesterol was still too high. And I, and I told him, you need to get it under uh, 150 or close to 150 and it was only about 185. So he came to our program then, okay? And after he went through our program uh, and did some changes for about eight weeks, this was what the second study shows. It says the echo portion of the test was considered negative for ischemia. Patient has done well with lifestyle changes. The plan, he will continue diet and exercise and aspirin. And those of you who are medical doctors or epidemiologists, actually the aspirin was not indicated in his case. He never had a heart attack yet. But anyway, so, here I wanted to compare that with and show you this little study. Uh, this was from Lopes in the New England Journal of Medicine 2009. And this was a study done comparing the failure rate in bypass grafts depending on whether the, the saphenous vein was harvested by open excision or laparoscopic techniques. And you can see that the open uh, dissection of the saphenous vein is more uh, apparently it makes the surgery last longer, right? The failure rate is lower. Okay, so when the surgeon looks at this chart, what they get out of it is, oh, I should use open excision. But when a lifestyle medicine doctor looks at the chart, we say, wait a minute, 43% of bypasses fail in 12 to 18 months. We need to make lifestyle changes. And compare that, if you will, to this uh, image that many of us in lifestyle medicine see all, uh, many places. This is actually Dr. Joe Crow's left anterior descending artery, a friend of, uh, and colleague of Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. And Dr. Crow had on the left side, you can, if you know how to read these, all that lumpy bumpy, he had lots of atherosclerosis in his artery, lots of blockages. After 32 months on a plant-based diet, and Dr. Crow was allergic to statins, he could not use them. He had a, a vein that looked more like a, an artery, I'm sorry, that looked more like a teenager. Yeah, there's the plant-based diet, 32 months without medication. Amazing change. So when I show these kinds of, uh, when I show these kinds of stories, I always have some in the audience many in the audience who say, okay, but Dr. Kelly, you don't understand. I just have bad genes. You know, my grandparents, my parents, it's on both sides. I mean, I'm doomed. Well, let me tell you, we inherit something besides genes from our parents. We inherit lifestyle preferences, lifestyle habits. And it's especially noticeable to me when I travel to a foreign country. I'm from America, so I come to Taiwan, your beautiful country, but you have different habits than we do. Some of them are excellent. I wish we had some of your habits. Uh, uh, I probably shouldn't be so bold to say that maybe you could adopt a couple of habits from America. But anyway, 
That's the problem. Amer uh, the world is adopting too many habits from America, to be very honest mm -hmm. with you, when it comes to lifestyle. Well, here's an issue in Time uh, magazine that was the whole issue was about this very thing, and I want to just use it as an illustration. It was uh, January 2010, so it's been a few years. But uh, the whole issue of Time Magazine was on the new science of epigenetics and, it, and how we have discovered, the geneticists have discovered, to their amazement, that um, the choices we make, what you do, I'm going to pay attention now, what we do. By the way, have you heard the little story about the, the four frogs sitting on the log? and? Four of them decided to jump in the water, and one did. How many frogs are still on the log? Three. So the point of deciding to do something is different than doing it. So my point is here that it's what you actually do that changes the genes and your gene switches, as you're going to learn. It's not what you think about doing. So here's a little history. Uh, this was an actual photograph taken when Dr. Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize. This was in the 50s, 1950s. That was the previous century. Uh, as I remind myself, I was actually I was alive when that happened. But uh, I certainly wasn't watching the, watching it happen. So Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize for discovering that uh, deoxyribonucleic acid is the molecule that contains the genes. Okay, the, the inherited information. And, you know, the longer we've, we've studied this, the more we appreciate the complexity of the problem. You know, some of you who are versed in genetics know that there was a lot of reason to think that the molecule deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, was too simple to contain such complicated information. We just didn't take into account the fact of how big it is. Do you realize that in every cell in your body, there's two meters long of DNA, if you stretch it out, two meters in every cell. You have trillions of cells. So if we stretched out the DNA in your body, it would reach to the, probably to the sun and back. It's just, just huge, long. But anyway, the proteins were much more complicated and, uh, and complex, and that's where they thought that the inherited information is. And as you're going to learn here in a moment, they were both partly right and both partly wrong. Then the next milestone to keep in mind is the Human Genome Project that was headed by Dr. Francis Collins, pictured here. He's now the director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And they uh, did the sequencing, the first sequencing of the human uh, genome. See there, 20, uh, 3 billion base pairs. Let me go back one picture and show you. A base pair is, in this molecule, you'll see there's like cross, uh, cross bars between the two. Like a, is, to me, I think of this DNA as sort of like a ladder that's been twisted. But anyway, the cross are the base pairs, three billion of those. So it's actually uh, been shown that the human mind almost cannot conceive of a billion, okay? They've, they've done a variety of interesting social experiments. We find it almost impossible to comprehend a billion. 25,000 individual genes, lots of variations. The most common thing that most of us are familiar with about the DNA variations is the, down at the bottom there, the uh, testing. Uh, in the, around the world now, DNA testing can tell us apart with greater uh, resolution than anything, including fingerprints. Even the DNA differences are more distinct and uh, certain than the differences in fingerprints. Some of these differences cause disease, like sickle cell disease. Here's a case on the left side is the sickled cell, a red blood cell, and uh, it's all caused by just this one uh, difference in the DNA. But most of the DNA variations uh, do not cause any disease or problem. Okay, now another little biology lesson while we look at this picture here. I don't know if you have these little creatures in Taiwan or not, but uh, these are hedgehogs. And I want you to just remember your biology for a moment. Uh, where, where did each one of us come from? We came from an egg, or uh, it's called an ovum, uh, from mama, from our mother, 
and a sperm cell from our father, those two cells, do you realize those two cells alone will not survive? They, they, they cannot divide, they cannot produce, they cannot, they die. The, the fate of an unfertilized ovum or an unfertilized, uh, or, or a sperm that doesn't fertilize an ovum is death. So when they become together, fused, you get one cell. And half of the chromosomes from father, half from mother, and then that one cell begins to divide. You know, cells multiply by dividing. I'm enough of a mathematician, I find that funny and, and enjoyable. Uh, but anyway, so they, each cell can become two cells, that's it. Then each one of those cells can become two cells. And of course, as you know, from uh, binary exponential, that can become a very large number. So here's my question for you. If every cell has a copy of the same DNA, how does it make such different tissues? Some of it makes an ear, you know, some of it makes a toe, some makes a brain. And did you realize that you have all the genes for a liver in your ear? Aren't you glad those genes are turned off? So, in fact, what we've discovered to our amazement is that most genes in every cell are actually quiescent, or they're turned off, the majority. And you, do you think, think about this, I have all the genes for a left ear in my right ear. So it's the distinction between every tissue in your body, every cell in your body, has to do not with the genes, but with the switches. The switches are what make the distinction between the cells. In fact, I don't have time in this talk, but I give another talk I give on this, and we now have uh, been successful at turning fibroblasts into functioning cardiomyocytes by changing the gene switches. You could turn, in essence, in essence a skin cell into a heart cell and it's being done successfully in mice. So it's remarkable what the switches have. Uh, in fact, one other thing I'll say, this is sort of an extra added, not part of the talk, but I find this so fascinating. And that is that the switches have been shown to be the cause of aging. Aging is not automatic. A cell only ages as the switches on the genes cause it to age. And they have shown that we can reverse the age of a cell by changing the switch settings. That's quite remarkable too. If there's any creationists in the room, uh, which I am now, I used to be evolutionist, I'm now creationist, I find that remarkably interesting philosophically and theologically. Well now, Dr. Whitelaw is an expert, let me quote her. She says that what we inherit actually is not DNA. I mean, uh, we inherit chromosomes, and the chromosomes are only 50% DNA. The other 50% of the chromosome are proteins. So maybe it's no wonder that discovering which one of those two, the DNA or the protein, carried the genes was a task worthy of a Nobel Prize. Because Watson and Crick had their work cut out for them to discover which piece of the chromosome really had the heritable information in it. So I'm going to go fast here. This is a little detail. For those of you who are really into the science, this will be very useful. You can look at the handout. But here what I have here is I just want to show you that this is uh, studies done in monozygotic twins, okay, identical twins. So this is two people that came from the same uh, zygote, okay, they have the exact same DNA, monozygotic twins. And what this little study did was it looked at the differences in the chromosomes between the twins when they were three years of age versus the differences between the twins when they were 50 years of age. And what we discovered was, uh, and you can see this is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> apologies. Uh, my screen showed the picture. Uh, the, what we have is the, the electrophoresis, if you, those of you here are familiar with any of the biochemistry stuff. So on the, on the left side are the actual uh, pictures of the electrophoresis showing the changes that took place. And you can see the bands that were common at three years of age have started to separate at 50 years of age. And then over here on the right you see. So anyway, there's just thousands of differences that have occurred during the lifetime of identical twins. 
And uh, here's a little more colorful picture. I'm, uh, that's just for uh, pizzazz. You can read a, go to the, the reference there, Proceedings National Academy of Science. But, but anyway, you have all kinds of beautiful biochemical ways to, to illustrate what's happening. And the bottom line is that there's just tremendous differences in the gene expression of identical twins by the time of 50 years of age. Here's what they're looking at, actually, is there's different ways of uh, switches. These are two of the simplest kinds of switches that have been discovered. Uh, they're actually still, science is still discovering this more and more switches. There are, they, we do not understand yet even all of the kinds of switches there are on the genes. But uh, one of them is the methyl group that's attached to the actual sugar on the DNA molecule. And the presence or absence of the, of the methyl group can turn genes on and off. And then over on the right, right hand side, is, uh, there's a acetyl group that can be attached to the tail of a histone chaperone protein. And that can also be a switch. But there's microRNAs. Some of you who are up on this, you know there's microRNAs and many other kinds of switches that are being discovered. And uh, in fact, some of the genes in your chromosome actually code for switches to other genes. So this is fascinating stuff. I don't think it'll be solved in my lifetime. So the DNA and the chaperone proteins the, the determine which genes are turned on and off, those, we, we inherit those. And so when you were born, you were born with that. And what we've discovered is that diet uh, is the strongest, has the strongest effect on our gene switches. I'm going to skip over this in my talk, but mention it only. There's some slides in the handout if you're interested, uh, where they did some research um, in, I believe it was Sweden, I forget the actual country, one of the northern European countries, and they looked at uh, the effect of diet, and they showed, uh, here's the chart, they showed that the diet of the grandparent was more strongly predicting the diabetes in the grandchild than the diet of the parent, which was very interesting. Again, stop and think a moment. Where Do you realize that the ovum the ovaries in a, in a developing uh, woman, baby. These are populated, those cells are produced in the ovary when she's in the first three or four months of gestation. So the egg that, uh, the eggs develop, the ovum develop in the baby while it's in the mother's womb. So the egg that I came from, the egg you came from, formed in my mother's ovaries while she was in my grandmother's womb. So the ovum, the egg I came from, again, was produced in my mother's ovaries while she was in my grandmother's womb. So not surprising there is a multi-generation uh, uh, epigenetic influence, the switches on the ovary, uh, on the, my, the egg I came from. Some of those switches were set based on my grandmother's lifestyle. So, uh, yeah, this talking about diet having a strong effect. Then the genes are turned on and off. We inherit the genes setting. When you, when you are born, you not only have 25,000 genes, you have thousands and, and thousands of switches. So I want to now uh, bring this towards a close as we talk about three studies real quick. Um, and that is, I just want to make sure I know where the, the time chart is. Um, the first one is uh, in mice. The, one of the mice here, the one with the dollar signs, is called the Goody Mouse. It has been engineered to have uh, the genes for diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and so forth, to study these diseases in mice. And uh, researchers at Duke University who are studying epigenetics had a a uh, great idea to use the agouti mouse to do a study they were looking to evaluate. Could they change the gene switches in utero? So they wanted a model where you could feed the mother a special diet and try to change the gene switches on the developing fetus. So they used this, this model. 
And when the, and, to, and to this day, this is still making waves. You can still go to the website and see some of their pictures. But when the baby was born, they made history. And this was first published in uh, the Journal of Experimental Biology of 1998. And what, of course, if you look at these two mice, if these were in human beings, uh, I don't know how it is in Taiwan, but in the United States, we would have what's called a paternity suit. <laughs> Somebody would say, that's not my child. Uh, it doesn't look like me. But when they check the genes, they, both of those mice have the genes for obesity, heart disease, diabetes. They are there, but the genes have been silenced by the diet fed to the mother. Now, since I have so many young women in the audience, I want to stop just long enough for you to think about that. And men. Men and women, I mean, I'm not going to have to think about this. My children are all born. I'm not having children anymore. But some of you are. And think about this. The effect of your lifestyle can give your child a special kind of a start, either a good start or a bad start. And that's exciting. I have seen many young women especially come to my uh, presentations on lifestyle and get motivated by this to make changes that talking about diabetes didn't even, you know, they didn't, it didn't register that, well, I'm, you know, 25, I don't have diabetes. Uh, but you do have the possibility of passing a blessing onto your children. By the way, this was not a, this was a secular group of people's, people doing the study, and notice what they said that the effect was noticeable for three to four generations later. If there's any Bible students in the room, I refer you to Exodus 20. You'll find a similar phrase in the Ten Commandments. But anyway, so think about that, that when you are living a lifestyle and thinking about having children. Now I want to show you another study. This is in rats. So we're going to go from mice to rats. In these rats, there's no special genetic engineering. They're just wild rats, you know, used in the laboratory, white, white rats. Um, but what they did here, and this was published in uh, the Journal of Neuroscience in 2008, and the researchers fed wild rats, no special genetics, a, a diet, a high-fat diet, in an effort to turn on genes that were, are, that were in the, already in the, uh, in the genome. And they were, I love this, I mean, I, my undergraduate was biochemistry and molecular biology, and I could have been very happy being a biologist. Uh, it's very, to me, it's very exciting stuff. And elegant research that had to be done to find this. But they were able to show that the high-fat diet fed to the mother turned on genes on chromosome 3 in the developing fetus and as you'll see in the, uh, the second, under neurogenesis, it actually created a higher population of a certain type of neuron. It, it, it caused, the mother's diet caused anatomical changes in the brain of the developing baby. Just think about that statement again. This research showed that by feeding the mother a, a certain type of diet, a high fat diet, they could change the anatomy of the hypothalamus in the developing baby. That led to, uh, well the main point here is that after birth and during adolescence, the uh, baby had these characteristics. It had a higher blood lipids, so if this was in humans we would say they had hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, high triglycerides. It had a higher food intake. It, it, every time it goes down to McDonald's it wants to supersize the meal. Uh, it had a preference for fat. They would rather have fat if you gave it a choice of food. Uh, it had early puberty, meaning the, these offspring would start having babies sooner, younger age, and had a higher body weight. Now, this came out, I remember this was published in November of 2008 because the American Heart Association was meeting at the same time, and I remember seeing an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, there's a newspaper in the United States, and they asked 
and the, the reporter, the health reporter, asked the uh, acting president of the American Heart Association to comment on the results of this study. And here's what the lady said. I cannot remember her last name. It, it was Barbara someone. She said, that study shows there is more to America's obesity epidemic than we have ever realized. Because the amount of fat in the diet fed to this rat was only around 55% of the calories from fat. The average American is eating 42, 43%. But our children, some studies have been done on, on uh, school lunches and the food left in the trash can, and uh, they have discovered that our children are eating close to 50 to 60 percent of calories from fat. If the same effect is happening in humans that was happening here in rats, uh, no wonder we are having a problem. And then last, men. I'm gonna, well, the, the, the next study. I have two more, but this next study is in men with prostate cancer. This is called the Geminal Study, published Proceedings National Academy of Science in 2008. We looked at 30 men that had uh, slow-growing, indolent, uh, low-risk prostate cancer. These men did not get surgery or radiation, etc. chemotherapy. They instead took a lifestyle change. The, uh, they donated uh, prostate biopsy. So they actually, the researchers took a needle um, put into the prostate to take a sample of the prostate cancer. And that, uh, from that, they were able to purify messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is used, as you know, when a gene is turned on and it's being expressed, copies of messenger RNA are made. And that's, so it's a sort of a way to monitor which genes were turned on and off by looking at the messenger RNA. And uh, here's the intervention that they had. Uh, again, a very similar diet to what uh, many Seventh-day Adventists eat and certainly it's similar to, to what uh, many lifestyle programs like the one I have in Black Hills, we use a similar diet to this. Now this is what's called a heat map and you can see there's 30 columns on each side, 30 men, one column for each man on the pre-intervention and then another column on this side, so there's a total across the whole thing of 60 columns. Then there's each row is a different messenger RNA. Okay, a different uh, gene, turned on or off. The color at each one of those cells is dark if there was a lot of messenger RNA or light if there's very little of that messenger RNA. So you should be able to just look, most people can look at this and see there was a big difference, a lot more dark on the left and less on the right. In fact, when they did the counting, there was uh, over 450 genes that were turned down and um, over about 50 that were turned up and uh, are on. And when they just looked at some of the genes they recognized, many of them they did not recognize, but some that they recognized, the ones that were being turned on, some of them we know are cancer-fighting genes. And on the ones turned down, some of those we know were cancer-causing genes. So there's much more research to be done, but it was clear that, that hundreds of genes were changed in 90 days by a lifestyle change. And in the, the gross examination of the prostate, the prostate cancer was in remission, okay? It was shrinking. Notice this. This is something special about lifestyle that is so important. This was a study of what, what did these men have? Prostate cancer. But notice what happened. They lost weight. Their blood pressure came down. Cholesterol dropped. And so what we've discovered is a wonderful synergistic uh, principle here is that when you treat a one condition with lifestyle, you usually end up improving whatever else happens to be wrong as well. Um, I, the first time I heard a scientist comment on this was Dr. Campbell in a talk years ago, and he, he pointed out how fortunate that when you use lifestyle interventions, you don't have to worry about the side effects and well, how, how much of this should I give before I stop because I don't want to cause some other disease? You know, when you use a medication, you're all, almost always we're trying to make sure that we don't cause side effects that are harmful with a medication. But with lifestyle, we haven't yet seen that. Okay, I'm going to close with these two here. The sleep, real quick. They looked at uh, the effect of sleep deprivation and they found, I'm going to move fast, 
basically they, that 711 genes were changed, the expression of 711 genes were changed by sleep deprivation in young healthy adults. And uh, so, this is, I'm always preaching to myself when I talk about sleep because I'd be, I have to on, be honest with you, this is one of my weak spots. I'm, uh, I, like, I wish I could stay up 24 hours a day. Sooner or later I always find I have to sleep. But, uh, this is a, I'm half joking. I got a good night's sleep last night. I feel really good uh, this morning. Then the last is exercise. Someone has asked the question, and I, I think it's a great question. Okay, so lifestyle changes, gene switches. How long does it take to do that? You know, how long does it take to, before you can change a gene switch? Well, they did it in exercise, was where they decided to do the study. And they took trained athletes, and they, uh, they had them exercise, and, and they took a sample. Uh, they had to, of course, take a sample of the tissue, right, of the muscle, and, and I'm sure that didn't feel good. Then the, the uh, people exercised for 15 minutes, and they took another sample. Anyway, when the study was finished, and, and it's published here in uh, Cell Metabolism 2012, they didn't have the answer to the question. That's one of the discouraging things as a researcher, is you do all the research and you don't find the answer. And the reason they didn't find the answer was the switches were already changed on the first measure. So they, the genes switches changed in less than 15 minutes of exercise. I don't know how long it takes with food. Maybe 15 seconds. I, I actually think, I know this, I know my salivary glands can anticipate that I'm going to eat and I haven't even started eating yet. So I think the genes are probably changed uh, with diet, even before you put the food in your mouth. <laughs> Let me share a contrast, another little study uh, published in Circulation in the American Heart Association. This was a study done, a randomized trial, looking at 101 patients to see how lifestyle change compared to stent, putting the little stent in the artery for heart disease. And what they found was, oops, yeah, I'm sorry. So 51 patients were assigned to the exercise group and uh, 20, 50 assigned to get the stent, an angioplasty. And I, to make it personal and, and make it have an emotional uh, link, let me ask you this question, not to answer out loud. But suppose that your mother or grandmother was in the study and she was randomly assigned to either get exercise or to get the stent for her disease. Which one would you be hoping she got assigned to? Would you be praying, oh, I hope she gets some real treatment? Okay, but before you finish your prayer, look at the next slide. Because here's the, what's called a survival chart. And so both groups start off at 100%, but as they start to have events, uh, it, it comes down. You can see that, that the stent uh, had 70% at one year was, had, it had worked, there was no adverse events. But in the exercise group who did not get the stent, it was 88%. So next time you pray for your mother, you can pray that she gets assigned to the exercise. By the way, if you take, uh, if you take the exercise, you do not have to have a blood thinner for the rest of your life. Uh, how important is this? Okay, some people say, well, that's very interesting, Dr. Kelly, but what does this really mean? Well, Dr. Uh, Feinberg is one of the experts, recognized experts on this field at Johns Hopkins, and he says in his article down here, it's uh, Epigenetics is at the Epicenter of Modern Medicine, Chan JAMA 2008. And you know, as I have already mentioned, lifestyle has the greatest effect on gene expression. These two facts right here are why lifestyle medicine is, is, is destined to become the center of primary care and of medicine uh, around the world. And it's happening. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm here is because the Asian Society of Lifestyle Medicine meeting is happening starting tomorrow. So Dr. Jertle is actually the gentleman who was in charge of the laboratory that did the Agouti mouse experiment. Okay, he sort of started this whole thing. And what he says here is remarkable. I'm going to read this. Epigenetics is proving we have some responsibility for the integrity of our own genome. Before, before epigenetics, genes predetermine outcomes. Now everything we do 
Everything we do, everything we eat and smoke can affect our gene expression and that of future generations. Epigenetics introduces the concept of what? Of free will. I'm sorry I don't know how to say that in Chinese because I would love to emphasize. And this is why I share epigenetics with my patients. They must understand, this is so powerful to realize, that the switches are largely under your control. We don't yet know to what extent the switches are under con your control. We know that we're finding more and more are under voluntary control than we ever imagined. You may not be able to ch choose your genes, but you can change the gene switches in many, many cases. And as he says, it introduces the concept of free will into. So here, health is the phenotype, okay? That's the expression of your genes. What are the drivers of the phenotype? Well, the DNA sequence, um, this slide is a little old. The numbers are actually getting smaller. It's the, the best science now, I think, is indicating it may be less than 10% of your health is actually determined by the genes you got from your mother or father. Medical care, that's, that is important, but um, again, it can be far less than 10% and the environment is 10. So this was a fairly uh, conservative slide. That leaves 80, 70 to 80% of your health is actually from your lifestyle choices. And one of the places we get this information, just for those, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a professional skeptic. I like to be skeptical because there's a lot of um, things that are not what they seem in this world. And so, I love skeptics, so if you're skeptical, I'm on your team. But anyway, we've done studies in monozygotic twins is one of the best sources for this kind of information. And it's clear, because see, there you eliminate the, the, the issue of the difference between the genes. And you can look at the differences in lifestyle and medical care and so forth. And uh, it's very, very important. Okay, well, I'm going to... Um, Skip to, I have another slide I'm going to show you instead. Oh, I'm sorry, this is coming. All right, so every cell in our body has a full copy of the genome. We, we've established that. Different genes are turned on and off by the environment, with diet being the strongest uh, factor we have so far. The DNA sequence is fixed, yes, but the epigenome is stable but reversible. If you're into uh, chemistry, as most nutritionists would be some, to some degree, the bonds involved in the gene switches are covalent bonds. And that means it gives it a stability, okay? Um, but changeable. So the gene switches are stable, but reversible. Lifestyle choices control gene expression by the genome. So you end up with this here, is the sum, summation. You change your diet and lifestyle, and that's not always easy to do. I used to smoke. I remember quitting smoking. You know, uh, Mark Twain from the U.S. said, oh, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it thousands of times. <laughs> and, and I had to do it like four times, you know, myself, before it took. I quit smoking in the 70s. That's been, well, 40-some years ago. But change your diet and lifestyle, and that will change your epigenome. And again, we can measure that and, and quantify that biochemically. We know this. Change the epigenome, and that will change gene expression. And if you change gene expression, well, it changes you. In fact, we could. We could take a cell from your ear and change the gene switches properly, and you could turn it into a liver cell or turn it into a myocyte, heart, a heart cell. These are things that are being done in animals, so we know it can be done. So, my final, here's the points. Gestational diet, turned off disease genes inserted into a goody mouse, and it, you can see the effects for three to four generations. Number two, gestational diet turned up the wild type genes in rats, altering both brain anatomy and neurophysiology in the adolescent pups. Number three, therapeutic diet changed expression of more than 450 genes in human prostate cancer cells in 90 days. By the way, improving um, other factors as well, heart and weight and blood pressure. And 20 minutes of exercise, oh, I'm, my apologies, I said in, the, in my talk 15 minutes. It was 20 minutes was the, uh, it took. 
Well, it might have only taken 15, but they didn't measure it until 20 minutes. So 20 minutes can change gene switches in muscle cells. Thank you for your kind attention, and uh, I, will, I will take questions, uh, at, I believe, at the time with the rest of the speakers. Dr. John Kelly 给我们一个非常精彩的演讲那我们可以听到说其实你的饮食跟生活形态真的是对你有很大的影响不只是你自己它可以在很短的时间内对你的基因的表现有所影响甚至影响到你的后两代那大家可能会很好奇说想说那我